Great. So as most of you know, I've been with the hub since 2010 or, or with the Hornada rather since 2010. Um, first as a postdoc, I'm a research hydrologist looking at um, land use and climate change impacts on water quantity and quality and then snow melt as well. Um, so today I'm going to try to facilitate our climate conversation and really talk about some observations and then some climate solutions. So as we know, we're, we're seeing climate change impacts now, um, but there are some things we can do to, um, to respond to those things. And so I want to talk about the solution space and where we are in terms of how we can work together as a research community to move forward into those solutions. So the hubs were formed in 2013 and they were announced in February 2014. Mm -hmm. They were really part of USDA's response to President Obama's climate action plan. So there are 10 hubs across the nation. Five of these hubs are located at ARS research units and the other five are located at Forest Service Research Units, but we work across USDA with Risk Management Agency, Farm Service Agency, APHIS, NRCS, everybody. You can see us in the Southwest located at the Hornada, but covering New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and Hawaii. And the point or the goal or the mission of the hubs is to develop and deliver science-based, we're all scientists led by research scientists, region specific, agriculture varies by region across our country and so do climate change impacts, information to help support climate informed decision making with the vision of robust and healthy uh, systems under increased climate variability and climate change. So how do we do this? How do we do this work? We operate in three functional areas for those of you who haven't heard about the hubs before. We do research and we do a lot of science synthesis work. Um, this might tie in with the work that we've been doing with Nick and Brandon around air quality and climate change or the work that our team has been doing with the Sustainable Southwest Beef Project, synthesizing information to help make or support climate informed decisions. We also develop tools, decision support tools. A good example would be our Ag Risk Viewer that um, Brandon supported, but it covers the entire nation. We're really excited about that. And thanks to, to Jeb and, and many others who help, helped that become a reality out of the Hornada, but covering the nation. Um, and then I think outreach is maybe not the right word. We convene scientists and stakeholders around climate adaptation, a lot of different pieces of that. And I'll talk about that a bit more as we move through this. So overarching and kind of the, the overarching view of this is that we have a lot of this really great science-based information. And much of this comes from the work at the Hornada, the science-based information that we share via peer-reviewed journal articles. And sometimes that's the end goal. That's what we count, right? That's, what, that's kind of our, our metric of success. But then how does that information support climate informed decision making? And that's really the, the top arrow, the arrow going to the right is, is part of what the climate hubs try to do. Take information from the Hornada, but also from across the region and help support decisions. At the same time, we need to know what information people need. We need to know what kind of decisions they're making, what the decision space looks like. We might have a solution that people can't implement because it's not economically feasible. So um, kind of taking what we learn from the field and feeding that back into our research institutions is the second part of, of this knowledge co-production cycle. Um, recently, I dropped this in the chat a couple of weeks ago, the USDA came out with its action plan for climate adaptation and resilience. Our hub and efforts of our hub, the Southwest, were mentioned six times in that document, in that less than 40 page document. So we're definitely um, out there and thanks to everybody who contributed to all of those efforts. There were also some things that were, were mentioned that we'll be doing in the future as well that were in this plan. So this was for all of USDA right now. Um, each agency is working on their own action plan. So ARS is working on one, NRCS is working on one. Those will come out in the future. So now transitioning a bit to what we're seeing in the Southwest, just for context. Um, and I think most of you know this or are experiencing this. 
You know that agriculture accounts for about 80% of the water use in the Southwest. And also that infrastructure is critical. Um, that could be major irrigation projects that have made our system and our landscape the way that it is. But it's also the infrastructure for processing and transportation. It's not so simple to say, let's just move chili production to another location. There's infrastructure and transportation and processing and heritage and history that are included in that. Water conservation strategies tend to be more economical than developing new supplies. And by developing new supplies, I really mean um, treating brackish groundwater or um, seawater, things like that. Ag to urban water transfers are happening. They're happening via leases, short-term and long-term leases. They're happening via long-term transfers. This is an economic solution for some agricultural producers. And in some locations, it's happening um, well, and in others, not so well. And so we're trying to pay attention to, to where this is working for a community. Um, there's low access to internet services. I did not believe this when I first read it, but now I know the Four Corners area, actually, this is true. <laughs> there, um, not all producers have access to internet. Not all agricultural areas in the region have access to surface water network as well, even though we have these major projects. A lot of folks depend on groundwater. Depth to groundwater across the region is increasing. And the implication of that, of course, is needing to drill deeper wells and also use more energy for pumping. And there's an economic um, implication for that. And then we're used to drought, right? Drought is reality in the Southwest. This is nothing new for us, but these multi-year longer, more intense droughts are becoming more problematic as we move forward. So now I'm getting into the five data slides and I'll, I'll go through this quickly so we can get to our conversation. Um, temperatures in New Mexico have already risen about two degrees since the beginning of the 20th century. The orange line you can see here is representing our observations across New Mexico. Um, since 1900, and then the gray line is the modeled historical temperature, uh, temperature. And then you can see we're moving into a lower emissions scenario and a higher emissions scenario. And out here at the end of the century, that's when this really matters. And it really um, supports mitigation. It supports anything we can do to reduce our emissions to keep that temperature from um, increasing um, as much as you might see in this red bar here. So that's what we've observed, and this is what we've projected out into the future. This is from the fourth national climate assessment. So it's really our most recent, most authoritative data on that for the Southwest and New Mexico. I also wanted to show you the observed number of extremely hot days. I know everybody says it feels like it's getting hotter, and it is. <laughs> if you look over time, these yellow bars are five-year average of the number of days where temperature, where maximum temperature rises above 100 degrees. And so you can see over time, there's a lot of variability in, in this number of days. But since about 1990, um, this, these numbers, this number of days is above the average um, for the, the five year. You can also see the annual variability here. I know we're all scientists, so we like to look at this. Um, so you can see these black dots are the number of days each year. So you can see that changing over time. We're pretty certain about temperature. Temperature has been increasing and, and it will increase into the future. I also wanted to show something we're less certain about, and that's precipitation. And so what you can see here, this is also from the fourth national climate assessment across the nation, looking at historic precipitation as compared to um, more recent observed changes in precipitation. And so here, you know, if you, these lighter colors are, are less of a change, if they're darker um, brown, it's a decrease darker blue, it's a stronger increase. And so you can see, we've seen a bit of a decrease in Arizona, Southern California, parts of Nevada. Um, over this time period, a bit of an increase in New Mexico. So that's what we've observed, again, from the fourth national climate assessment. These are projections. They are the higher scenario and they're the end of century. So we're looking at 2070 to 2099 as compared to the more recent and what I want to point out here is that 
we're fairly certain in the winter and spring in the northern part of our country, we're going to have an increase in precipitation and that that increase is going to be large compared to natural variation. But in this area with the hatching, which is um, the southwest for winter, for summer and for fall, you'll see brown. So it looks like there might be a little bit of decreasing, but this, this is showing areas where changes are small and relatively insignificant compared to natural variation. Part of that's because we have hugely variable precipitation across the landscape and, and throughout the year. One thing that you will see, we have a little more belief or, or stronger evidence that in spring, there will likely be a decrease in precipitation into the future. And you can think about what that might mean for the systems that you study and the things that you know about. I believe this is our last data slide. Um, this is no surprise, right? Elephant Butte Reservoir has been hovering around six or five or six percent of its capacity for a long time. But I, but I show this to talk a bit more about what about temperature, actually. So we have a bit of a certainty about temperature. And what does that do to the hydrologic cycle? Um, higher temperatures are going to decrease soil moisture. Higher temperatures are going to increase um, snow melt, decrease precipitation, so less snow will be falling, um, more will be falling as rain. How does that change our system? So I just wanna ask you as scientists to think about kind of what we know in terms of temperature and how that might affect our systems and the hydrology. So with that, we're gonna stop me communicating outwardly. <laughs> and we're going to do a bit of a chat waterfall. And Katie, hopefully you can put this question into the chat box or somebody.